Thanks. Uh, and welcome. Uh, welcome to Oregon Humanities' first 2016 Think and Drink. Uh, and a big welcome to Leila Lalami. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. So we're going to jump into conversation in just a couple minutes. Uh, we're going to talk for a bit and then uh, hopefully have a good amount of time for questions. Uh, I do want to say uh, just really I'm excited about the year that's kicking off and especially that it's kicking off with Layla here. Uh, it's a year that's th it's the 100th anniversary of the Pulitzer Prizes. And uh, <laughs> what that's meant is an initiative called the Pulitzer Centennial Campfires Initiative, um, which is a partnership with a lot of state humanities councils and it's provided an opportunity to bring in some people who are doing really great work in humanities areas, journalism, and to make sure that uh, people all over the state are getting to spend some time with them. And so Layla is here tonight and will be in Bend tomorrow. Uh, Hector Tobar will be here and then Eugene, Isabel Wilkerson, Catherine Boo. Uh, so we're just really excited about uh, the year and the kinds of thinking that Layla and those other folks will be helping us do. Uh, yeah. uh, I want to say a couple other quick thanks. Oregon Cultural Trust helps make this and hundreds of other events around the state possible. So a big thanks to uh, the Oregon Cultural Trust. Trust for the uh, Willamette Week as a communication sponsor, and then Literary Arts, uh, World Affairs Council, and the Schoenfeld series of distinguished writers up at the University of Portland really helped get the word out. So just a big thanks to all those folks for helping get these here. I'm not sure if I mentioned my name's Adam Davis. I'm with Oregon Humanities. It's not important, but I should have said it, so I'm saying it now. Uh, so as I assume many of you know, uh, Layla is a writer, and both novelist and essayist, uh, professor. As Dave Weish mentioned uh, early on to a few people that were out there, an early lit blogger, very early, uh, and uh, many other things, um, but also, uh, lived in Portland for a while. And I think some of what we're gonna be talking about is related to home and place and land. And so I wanted to start off just by asking, uh, coming back to Portland, does Portland feel like home in any way? It feels like one of my homes. I mean, it's very hard. Every time I fly into the city, I, I just feel like crying all the way from the airport to the hotel. It's just, it's, I miss it so much. Um, it's a beautiful city. It's one of the most literate cities I've ever lived in, and I have many great friends here. So um, in that sense, it feels homey. Um, the, the, the question of home for me is, is a somewhat complicated one um, because I was born and raised in Morocco but, um, but have lived in Morocco, in Britain, in the United States, um, and in the United States, I've lived principally in, in California. So it's just, it's not a sort of um, straightforward relationship. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And, and home can be defined as a physical space, but also as a cultural space, as a linguistic space. So, so it, it is a very uh, complicated question. Yeah, that's part of why I wanted to go there right <laughs> off the bat. Seems Let's simple, it. <laughs> is kind of complicated. Um, there's a character in uh, Secret Sun, an older book now, who, who says uh, home doesn't have to be a place, uh, or home might be something other than a place. Yeah. And I guess I wondered, and doesn't answer it, leaves it as a question. <laughs> and so I wondered if you have a sense of uh, what's on the other end of that question about home. I mean, this is where it gets a little bit, <laughs> a little bit personal. But um, so, so I was uh, born and raised in in Morocco, and um, it, it would seem that the answer to where is home would be very simple. Rabat, the capital, is my hometown. Um, and so, in in some sense, and my parents still live there, so that would be where home might be. But um, when I was a little girl, my parents decided to put me in a, a French school. Um, and what that meant was that uh, most of my very early education was in French. Most of my um, exposure to literature was in French, which is a foreign language. Obviously, I'm a native speaker of Moroccan Arabic. So when 
uh, you're exposed to literature in that way. It sort of creates a disconnect between the world of the imagination on the one hand and the world of reality on the other. In, in the sense that in your reality, you're surrounded by a particular culture, but every time you try to engage with the world of the imagination, you're surrounded by another culture. And so over time, it creates a disconnect uh, within yourself. And it's not, I'm not saying this because I want you know, to attract any kind of pity. I mean, this is the, the experience of many uh, people in formerly uh, colonized countries. Um, and so, and then, and then later, I mean, I went to Moroccan public school, read a lot of Moroccan authors, and, and so it was fine, but I never quite forgot that sense of disconnect, and so it always made me feel a little bit different from other people within my own, uh, my own culture, you know, so because I had that, that sort of, such a strong presence of, of French in my life. Um, and so I've always, I think, been curious about this idea of home. And then um, later on when I um, um, came to the United States, I came as a, to go to graduate school, and the idea was that I was going to um, try and get my coursework done as quickly as possible, and then I would return back home <laughs> to, write, um, to write my dissertation. But then after, I would say about a couple of years, I was before I knew it, I had met someone and I was married, and so, you know, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Um, and so I often joke with my husband that I had to give up, I mean, I had to give up quite a bit, I feel, um, for us to be together. I mean, I, you know, I um, moved essentially to Los Angeles and became a US citizen. So a lot of things had to be um, given up in that sense. And so, for me, the idea then of home becomes not so much about a place, but about a people. It becomes about the people in your life who matter the most to you. Um, and so that's why I say that it's a complicated relationship, and I guess in Secret Sun, that's one of the things that came up a lot in that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that home is chiefly, at least now, about the people who matter most to you. And then I was thinking about the most recent book about the Moore's account, and, uh, and especially the narrator. Yeah. Uh, Mustafa or Estebanico, depending on which name, right. seems like the more appropriate name. And thinking the Moor's account uh, of what, in a way. Yeah. In part, it feels to me like an account of uh, going to a place that's not their home, but is so, it are some people's home. I guess I wonder if you had thought what's on the other end of that. The Moor's account of. Right. So, so the idea is that um, it's it's kind of providing an alternative um, account of the, the Narvaez expedition. Uh, and in fact, the, um, the chronicle of the Narvaez expedition is called The Relation. And the original title of the book was The Relation, and then it felt like nobody was gonna even know what relation was, so I had to sort of simplify it. And, and, um, um, and, that's, and I, it was The Relation or The Moore's Account, and then I ended up taking The Relation out. And then that's how The Moore's Account became the title. But it is this alternative history about the Narvaez expedition. And in it, Mustafa does grapple with ideas of home, but um, he spends much of the book basically trying to return home. Um, and then at some point realizes that, um, in James Baldwin's words, I'm sure I'm mangling them, but uh, there, there are no untroubled places in this world. And so the idea that, you know, just by returning home that all of his, whatever troubles him is gonna go away is, is not happening, and so he decides to. So, uh, no, no untroubled places I can agree with, and then it also seems like uh, scales of troubles, and yes. in a way, especially <laughs> with Mustafa, who, who sells himself into slavery. Yeah. And as I was reading the Moore's account and your earlier books, I was thinking about the, who was telling the story and how, uh, you know, in some ways, you're choosing a voice to inhabit, a consciousness to inhabit. And I was thinking, it's very hard to inhabit other voices. Um, and in this case, two, the two biggest speakers are men, which at first I thought, that's interesting. Uh, these are men who were focused on. And, you know, there's, of course, five, 600 years back. That's hard to imagine. But the thing that really, the more I thought about it, that got me the most was you're imagining what it is to be a slave. Yeah. And I was just wondering how you do that. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the work of any novelist, right? You have to create a character and, and, and basically have the imaginative empathy with that, with that character, see the world through that character's eyes. But I was telling um, 
a, a few people earlier or yesterday, that it's not altogether that much of a stretch for me to, in, to, to see the world through a man's eyes, only because, as I said, when you're exposed to literature at such a young age and you think about all the books that you're exposed to, how many times do you see male main characters and how many times do you see female main characters? So the experience of being a woman is primarily an experience of seeing the world, at least in literature, through a man's eyes. So it's an experience that, um, th that in some sense, is not, it's not that much of a stretch for me to write from a male perspective. Whether I do it well or not, that's for you to decide, but it's not, it, it doesn't seem to me to be much of a stretch. Now, in terms of the experience of being a slave, again, it has to do with uh, using um, imagination and, and trying to um, trying to look at this, the, the, the same events that Camisa de Vaca looked at, but from the point of view of this outsider. Again, an experience that I'm quite familiar with of being an, an outsider, not just within, you know, linguistically, but also as an outsider in this, in this country, sort of. So, so, yes, there is a lot of work of imagination, but I think what drives us towards certain stories is also this personal connection. So it's kind of a combination of, of both. Mm -hmm. Did you have, uh, given what you just said about that the sort of dominant literary perspective, let's say, is from a, so you hear more men's voices than women's, did it make you wonder at all, should I be, should my voice be coming from a man or from a woman as with, or is that? <coughs> I don't think that way when I uh, try to come up with stories. So, so what happened with this book was that I was just, I was, it was complete happenstance. I was reading a book about Moorish Spain, not, and actually I was, you know, my, my second book had come out and I, you know, there's kind of a fallow period in between <laughs> books and I had no idea what I was going to work on next and this was just pleasure reading and, 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 and I came across a mention of this slave who was said to be the first Moroccan slave who was said to be the first black explorer of America. And that's really how it came about. It wasn't that I chose to write about a man. Uh, and certainly I've written from the point of view of female characters as well. And this next one also has a female character. But, but the story came first, this idea of what would happen if I retold the story of the Narvaez expedition, but from the point of view of Mustafa Estebanito. And Mustafa Estebanico, which do, do you think of him as one or the other, or both, or how does? Well, in writing the book, obviously as Mustafa, but then it's it's an interesting experience, right, to write about him as he thinks of himself as Mustafa, but then he is referred to and must refer to him, you know, to, to respond to the name Estebanico, and that um, I found to be a very interesting experience of erasure. Um, so <laughs> It's again, not that much of a stretch. It's something that we continue to see today. We see names that are simplified or changed because that way it makes it easier for certain other people to pronounce them. So, and our names are not incidental. They are part of who we are. And so when, when they are changed in that way, then um, I think it does something. I mean, yeah. I yeah. was going to say something else, but it's going to take the conversation in a completely right. different perspective. Ahead, I was going to say Barack Obama at one point was Barry Obama, so but then he <laughs> sort of reclaimed the name Barack Obama. You know, so I mean, a name is not; it is very much part of of who you are, and uh, simplifying it in order for other people to be able to pronounce it or be in, in order to be able to move in sort of this majority culture is uh, is kind of a burden on on the person and. and some people take it on and get used to it, and other people find that they want to cast this aside. Yeah, and you know, that's making me think of one of the characters in your collection of short stories, uh, Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, who... You know, every time you mention a book, I'm like, okay, you're gonna have to remember, what did I write? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have it in back, so we can... Uh, <laughs> <It's> like, okay. <laughs> but it, just think about erasure. I mean, names seem like, in a way, the quickest handle on it, but... Uh, the question of being seen or not being seen, and sometimes it seems like he, he's talk, he, he goes back to Morocco after he's been in Spain. Yeah. And You're talking about the main character. Yeah. Yeah. Aziz, I think, or the well, wrong character. Well, one of the four characters. You're talking about Aziz, just so I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when he's, and he has this experience right. of, um, he doesn't want to tell his family at home what it felt like to be in a store and to be watched by the security guard. Um, 
which feels in a way like the opposite of erasure. And then at the same time, he talks about in other places not being seen, not being greeted. So I guess I wanted to ask about that sort of better to be seen, better not to be seen. Well, I think, I mean, here the question is, it's a question of how we narrate um, ourselves to ourselves versus to others. I mean, the question of somebody like uh, Aziz, who has achieved what so many others in, in his family and in his sort of, like among his friends, that they've all wanted this dream of being able to immigrate to Spain and be successful, and he somehow pulled it off. Um, it would seem to him, um, an, uh, an acceptance of failure if he were to say that there is a downside to it. So he prefers to narrate the self as a successful self, and so therefore there's not that mention of being watched in the department store and being followed because he looks Moroccan. Um, and so that's how he chooses to narrate himself to other people. So I guess what I'm saying is that the question of identity um, that identity is malleable in that way, that we, that we sort of narrate ourselves differently depending on whom we are talking to, I guess. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And then we just had a short exchange before coming out, and you talked about having 25,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> yes. Which is a way of, uh, I mean, that's a certain identity you got out there, and a lot of people you don't know watching. Yes. Uh, what's that feel like? <laughs> and and I tied into the visibility question, I guess, yeah. if, it, if it's well, related. Here's the thing. It's actually interesting that you bring that up because Twitter is, is the only, um, maybe not the only, but it's one of those uh, forums where the, the, the more visibility you have, the more abuse you receive. Um, it is true. It is absolutely true. And, and Twitter does nothing about it. They keep changing their platform and adding heart buttons and I don't know what. And meanwhile, they have a huge abuse problem and they don't really find ways of, of uh, helping women and minorities deal with it. Um, and so, wait, how did we go on to this question? We're talking about, we're talking about identity, oh, identity and uh, being seen. Oh, being seen, and that's what it is. Okay, so, so, so this is where I was going with that. So, so when you become more <laughs> visible on Twitter, yeah. that visibility becomes challenged. So what happens is, say you tweet, oh, um, I'm having this delicious burger at blah, blah, blah. The m if, if you have no followers, nobody cares. But if you have 500,000 followers, how dare you eat a burger when, when 20 miles from there, somebody, somebody, these people are suffering, or this thing is happening, or this other news has just broken, or, you know, how, so, and so, so that visibility becomes challenged. Like, how dare you be yourself rather than perform a particular version of yourself for me, the public? Uh, you know, so, th so Twitter is one of those forums, I think, where it's really these questions of visibility uh, come up. And I think, uh, particularly for someone of my religious persuasion, shall we say, <laughs> uh, that, ca that can, you can see a lot of uh, abuse uh, on Twitter. And that th all those have to do with visibility. Yeah. And uh, I guess a couple things there. One, it sounds like, why hasn't Twitter figured out how to police this better? I, I don't know. Ask Jack Dorsey. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't take my calls. I, I wasn't. It was. It was more of a rhetorical He's question. He's too busy imitating Facebook, poor fellow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But in a way, what I was I was going toward the idea where I, uh, in a recent essay, you're talking about the response to bad speech, to hateful speech, is more speech. Yes. So I wonder about that. I wonder <laughs> if it's in a way, yes, people are abusive. Yeah. Uh, it, does that feel like a good thing or a bad thing? Is related to Charlie Hebdo? And I mean, yes, people are more abusive. And, and I guess the point of that abuse is to silence you. So it bothers them so much that you said you enjoyed that burger, to go back to our mm -hmm. example. So then what do you do? Stop eating burgers? Stop tweeting about eating burgers? Uh, you can. Otherwise, you know, then then the only people who will get a voice are these people who are telling others what to tweet or not tweet, mm -hmm. uh, or what to say or not say, what to print or not print, what to think or not think. I mean, it's endless. Um, and so, yes, that's why I do think that the answer to speech is more speech. Yeah. 
Yeah. And when you're when you've got Twitter on the one hand and a book based on one line about part of a, an exploratory yes, expedition. Yes, it started out as 140 characters. Is that where you're going? No, I was going <laughs> to move back from the short to the long to ask yes. like how to hold these two. Twitter is so ephemeral. Uh, it's there, it's gone, what's next? And now you're writing a book that's getting us into a world several hundred years ago. Yeah. And I guess I wonder about the status of that for us and the way we live right now. Why yeah. is it? Yeah. I mean, there's such different um, processes. You know, uh, Twitter is a place where you can be pithy and clever and sarcastic and funny, informative. You can tweet links. You can. I try to use. I try my very best to use it as an educational tool. Really, it, to educate myself and and hopefully to educate others. Um, but. The novel is such a different, such a just such a different project. It's first of all something that you devote yourself for hours on end every day over the course of several years, never knowing whether what you're writing is going to have any kind of merit to yourself, um, whether it's going to lead somewhere you want to explore, whether it's going to, when it's done, find readers. So it's it really is a journey of exploration. It's a journey into the unknown. Uh, and so it's just a completely different uh, writing than, 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 than being online and yeah. procrastinating, which is really what I do on Twitter. Whenever you see 10 tweets, know yeah. that, that you know it's time to start writing and I'm in panic mode because <laughs> I have to start work and it's like, oh, I have 30 minutes. What can I, what can yeah. I how can I best waste it? So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you said, uh, you talked about merit early on in that comment about writing fiction. Uh, and when Mustafa is a kid, his father is going to get him to be a recorder of deeds. And yes. Mustafa seems to say, I, I don't want to just record other people's deeds. I don't want to just write down what other people are doing. Uh, and so I guess I wonder, uh, what's the, it sounds like there is, I, I'm, I like novels. I think writing is a good thing. And when you talk about merit, how are you evaluating sort of what counts as merit in this world that you're laboring on for years? Well, I can only speak about how I um, evaluate it for myself, which for me is, is, has this piece of writing taken me someplace I haven't been before with a novel? So for example, this one was my first uh, piece of historical fiction. I wasn't sure I could do it. I didn't even know where to begin with the research, how to create. Like, I had no idea what I was doing when I started working on it. Like, no clue, no clue. I mean, I was so clueless that I thought, I thought, I have the plot. So that's one, <laughs> one, one problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> Little did I know that, in fact, the plot was a huge constraint because then you have whatever scenes you're creating have to be not only believable, but have, I still have to get these characters from Seville to Florida, to Mexico City. I mean, it's, it, is, it is a constraint more than anything else. Um, so the question is, is, am I doing something I haven't done before? Am I um, challenging myself as a writer? Am I learning to improve? So the, really the biggest test for me is, is this book better than the previous one? Is this piece of writing better than the previous one? Am I exploring um, things as a writer? Um, that, to me, is what m merit really means. So that sounds focused chiefly on the quality of the art that's produced and in a way the development of the artist in this case you. And I, w I feel like uh, also your writing is, uh, is political <laughs> and not just the writing on the page but uh, and not just the fiction but the essays, your, your Twitter account. And I wonder about that, whether there's any, whether thinking, well, I'm going to go back 500 years because of what it means now for for other people, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that um, I remember very vividly when I finished uh, working on Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, which is a collection of short stories. It was my first book, and I gave it to a writer uh, to read, and uh, she gave it back. This was when I was in Portland, and she gave it back to me, and she said, it's such a political book. And I was really entirely taken aback by that comment, because the book is about a group of Moroccan immigrants who tried to cross the Straits of Gibraltar on a lifeboat, and it hadn't the faint, faintest idea that anybody would look at this and think it's political. And in the years since, in the 10 years since, I've, I've 
sort of come to the realization that when somebody says this is political or points to a piece of art and says this is political, in some sense it tells me more about how they view the world, that, that there is this, this kind of um, ability to be apolitical, which means that you have a certain kind of privilege with respect to being apolitical that many other people don't have. So something that I don't even think of as being political, which is the life of these four characters going about something that you see every day in Morocco, suddenly is political. Um, only because, and what that usually means is why are you making me think about something that I would rather not <laughs> think about? Yeah. Something really uncomfortable, so therefore it must be political and therefore, you know, all, all these. So I am really impressed. Can I tell you? You're like you're you're bringing up these books, and and, and I'm, I'm <laughs> I said, yes, yes, no, Adam. But, you're but in a way, so there we, we were just talking about discomfort, and that was nice the way it just shifted this <laughs> way. That was good. Um, but it seems like discomfort is what, in a way, fiction. Sure, we want to enjoy it, but it. Uh, I mean, in a way, it sounded at the end there like you're pushing towards saying, well, I want the art to be, to stand on its own, but not to get into these uncomfortable areas because who wants discomfort? But right. I mean, I think well, we all I mean, it really is, a, it's a very worthwhile question. Like, are you approaching art because you're seeking a form of consolation? Are you looking at art as something that is supposed to console you, to make you feel better about the, your life or the rest of the world or whatever? Or are you looking at art just because it's art and it's beautiful? Or are you looking at it because you want it to make you feel a certain way, to make you think a certain way, to make you imagine certain things? Like, what is the purpose of, of that art? Yeah. <laughs> but even the title, Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits. Uh, so hope is an interesting thing. Yes. <laughs> I'm laughing because that question has come up in the last 24 hours several times. I don't know why the it's The question of hope or yes, the question yes, of Yes, yes, hope. How, how yes. has it come up? In well, people are like, what is, what is your problem with hope? <laughs> 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 why is it hope and other dangerous pursuits? And uh, yeah. Dan Jordan. Dangerous but presumably worthy <laughs> of hope? <laughs> no, it's just that I think... In the case of hope and other dangerous pursuits, it's because it's it's really I wanted I wanted um, something in the title that that sort of conveyed both the hope that that the characters in the book are feeling like they're all hopeful that even though the statistics say otherwise, mm -hmm. even though all indicators are that they will be captured and deported under the best of circumstances. Uh, and under the worst of circumstances, they will end up drowning in the in Mediterranean Sea. They still hold on to the hope that they will be the ones to make it and somehow cross and, and be able to uh, find jobs and have successful lives. Um, and then, uh, and so, so, so they're clinging to the hope and then there's this constant danger and I wanted both of those things in the title. Um, that, that people are like, well, why are you saying that hope is a dangerous pursuit? Well, you know, yeah, if, if, if hope is something that can shackle you into um, a particular uh, state of affairs or a particular condition, then yes, I mean, it, it is dangerous. Then you have to take action and not just hope. So. Yeah, if we go back to the Moore's account yeah. with hope in mind a little bit, then maybe we can push even to hope closer to home, um, but uh, the sort of scale of hope that seems to shift for Mustafa or Estevanico seems to be, he kind of wants to be, it fe felt to me like at a certain point his hope is uh, to be free himself, maybe to do less damage than is being done. I guess I wonder if you were thinking uh, about what people reading it might come away from, might, might come away feeling in any way? Um, not really. Only, be <laughs> only because with something like this, I think it's, um, I wrote it so that I could think about, I wrote it so I could think about these things for myself. Mm -hmm. I think worrying a little bit too much about what readers are gonna take away from a piece of writing or what, what they're going to think about a piece, especially what they're going to think about a piece of writing, uh, can be quite dangerous because then if you think about that, then the instinct is to try and satisfy a, that, um, that particular reader. And then from there, then it becomes 
writing to meet the expectations of that reader. So it's kind of <laughs> a slippery slope. Um, so I try my, my best not to think about readers. And I think also with writing, no, to my mind, no worthwhile piece of writing, no piece of writing is worthwhile if it doesn't involve risk. And you cannot really be risky in your writing if at some point you're worrying what is this reader going to think or what is you know this this person going to think or this reviewer is going to think then by definition it it prevents you from taking risks so i think it's very important in writing that at least to me it's very important that the writing be as risky as possible and does that feel true both for the sort of current stuff and the fiction stuff that as you're I writing think essays so. and I stuff. think so I think so I mean obviously with 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 the fiction because there's such longer projects and y you really it's it's such an uh, sustained amount of focus and work and attention over the course of many years it's very easy to lose yourself into it with the nonfiction at least the kind of nonfiction that I write these essays they take a few weeks to write and sometimes for example, with the more recent, you know, commentary on, on uh, terrorist attacks, or sometimes I'll write them in, in three or four days. Um, but in any case, I am not writing them because I'm trying to um, make readers feel a certain way. I'm trying to, just like anybody else, trying to sort out what is happening for myself. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes me want to ask about one of the more recent essays that seems like people have been paying a lot of attention to, and that's about the gray zone, mm -hmm. uh, which does feel like, uh, in a way, trying to make sense for yourself. But I guess I wonder, like, if you if you be comfortable saying what you understand the gray zone to be, and what you're trying to sort out by thinking about that thing. Well, I, so so the gray zone is is um, it's a term that appeared on the cover of the magazine that ISIS puts out. ISIS puts out a monthly magazine, which is a very, it's a slick magazine. It's, it's very well produced. Uh, it has color photos. Um, if you've never had to read it <laughs> for research purposes, <laughs> count yourself a lucky person. But, um, but anyway, um, the, so in February of last year, they came out with, the, with an issue and on the cover, it said the extinction of the gray zone. And, uh, what they're saying is that the attacks of, sept of September 11th ushered in um, a new era where it, the, it, the two camps, the camp of the Crusaders and the camp of uh, the Caliphate, um, became kind of clear for everyone. And everything that's in between is the gray zone. The gray zone is the space inhabited by any Muslim or anybody who has not so for any Muslims that have not joined the ranks of ISIS or for anybody else that has not joined the camp of the Crusaders. So it is the, s the, z the zone of coexistence between people. It's the zone that all of us inhabit. And if you think about it, all of us have gray lives. Nobody has a life that is entirely um, black or white. We all move between cultures. We all move between languages and um, sometimes between religions and or belief or unbelief. And so it, to me, it is a very precious space and that is the space that, um, that ISIS wants to eliminate. Um, and what was really striking about that article is how approvingly it cited uh, George W. Bush and said that George W. Bush had been right to say that you're either for us or against us and that they, they agree with that vision of the world. And so when you read about that, it's it's very alarming um, and when I came across that I thought oh my goodness you know what does it really look what does it mean if you take that proposition to its complete logical end what does that really mean for the world it means a world in which there are only two camps people like ISIS on the one hand and the Crusaders on the other and they're dropping bombs on each other um, and that is this vision of the world. Uh, and that's what I was kind of trying to understand and to, to, to speak to the importance of preserving uh, that gray zone, which to me shrinks every time you see uh, people using sort of political rhetoric to turn people against one another or to make um, somebody hate another person. So today, for example, this is 
really uh, frightening, but um, the, so uh, people in South Carolina are gonna go to the, to the polls on Saturday. And so Public Policy Institute uh, came out with a poll asking voters in South Carolina what they thought and a number on a number of series of questions. And 80% of Trump supporters wanted to ban Muslims from the United States. 38% uh, wanted to, um, um, wished that the South had won the Civil War. Um, and another 38% not, were not sure who had won the Civil War. <laughs> I am not kidding. 38% and 38%. And it's like, so it's basically, it's basically this nostalgia for the South coupled with complete ignorance of basic history. It's just the most incredible thing. Um, and then um, another 30% wanted to ban gays from entering the United States. Uh, and then another alarming percentage, I forget what it is, um, approved of the policy of Japanese internment. Now, these, these numbers not, you know, are for Trump supporters, but if you look at the, the numbers for the others, Trump, I mean, um, uh, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz also have numbers that are not, um, um, that are troubling. But in, in the case of, of Trump, those numbers are the most Alarming, and of course, I understand that Trump is a cartoonish figure, and it's very easy to sort of laugh and say these people are crazy. What is going on? But th th this is what we mean by the extinction of the gray zone. It's this idea that that people are very willing to say there's a problem in this country, and that problem is this person or that person or this other person. And if you start doing that. Who else is going to be left? And it doesn't seem to have occurred to these people that um, this rhetoric that Trump is using against, take your pick, Mexicans, LGBT people, uh, the disabled, Muslims, you know, anybody, that, that, at, that at some point it might not turn against them as well. It doesn't seem to have occurred to them. And so, um, so it's just th this gray zone is this idea, this, this, this zone that we all who care about coexistence must really try to preserve. And it, and it comes from, so, so that's why it's very important to speak out about that stuff, even though it's very tempting to laugh about it, I understand. Yeah, uh, but it does sound like this is, uh, I mean, listening to you talk about the gray zone, and I think in an impassioned and very clear and informed way, <laughs> and knowing that you have a platform. Uh, it such as it is. Right? Such <laughs> as it is. <laughs> Uh, right, <laughs> it's a it's a weirdly uncomfortable yes. high chair. Uh, but and thinking again about that question before about uh, fiction, uh, politics, and uh, so I think that's some of what's I, people are probably wondering when you say why are they asking if it's political? I guess uh, here's an opportunity. These are all opportunities to uh, make that gray zone more visible. To make sure it's not creeping towards the big middle. I guess that's what I wonder about. That's what I was trying to ask about. Okay, so, so. <laughs> yeah, I didn't ask very clearly right yes. now. <laughs> no, uh, no, no, it's, it's me, I'm sure it's can we do that? Can we try to come at that question with a more specific example? And that's to go back, I asked early on in a uh, provisional way about gender stuff and about the narrators, but I guess I wonder if we were looking at uh, gender questions and thinking about the idea of the gray zone, thinking about in between. Um, there's this moment again in uh, Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits where a character goes home and he's in a cafe and he's, he's not sure, something feels different, something feels different, he can't tell what, and then he realizes, oh wait, there are no women in this right. cafe. Right. Um, but that's a realization that he comes to after he's been abroad for, for several years and then he returns and it strikes him something that he hadn't thought about before. In other words, he's looking at his neighborhood in a, in a separate, in a new light, shall we say. Yeah. Um, and so he's, th he's basically coming to the realization, well, wait a minute, you know, where are the women? And that's because cafes in Morocco, Morocco is a very uh, cafe culture. So you cannot go a block without there being a cafe. Most of them are sidewalk and most of them have men drinking cafes. And so now it's, it's changing now, of course, and, and uh, a number of these places have men and women, uh, but the, the traditional cafe is like these men who still smoke their cigarette and drink their cafe and just kind of people watch. And um, so it is very much a male space. And when Aziz comes back and, and sits at one of these places, it, it strikes him. 
uh, that that is a segregated place, that that is a place where, where men and women are not in the same. Yeah, which seems part of what I think I'm trying to, like our experience right now, we're in a room full of lots of different folks. We're up here together talking. Yes. We're speaking English, <laughs> which we might not be. We might be speaking <laughs> it, you know. Um, and so I guess I wonder about uh, moving to, like does the move towards greater complexity, which I feel like there's a line you say, where let's not, t any sentence that begins in a way with Muslim women are. Yes, oh my God, that is one of my biggest pet peeves. Well, because if you think about it, if you think about it statistically, like I've, I've, this is, I've been reduced to making statistical <laughs> arguments yeah. because clearly moral arguments are not getting me anywhere. Um, <laughs> But if you think about it, so you have, what, 1.6 billion Muslims. So when you say Muslim women, you're conservatively talking about 750,000 women. So think about what that statement is saying. You're saying 750,000 people are. And to me, that, that is just an incredibly um, arrogant statement because it's impossible to... Um, find something that 750,000 people have in common. Um, their faith, um, maybe their nationality, if you're in a country like India, it's a big country, so they're all, you know, carry Indian passports, say. But beyond that, like what else, what else can you learn from a statement like that? So I do resent um, these blanket generalizations. Not be, and, and when you say that, you resent that a lot of people think, well, well you don't want criticism. And it's like, it's, it has nothing to do with not wanting criticism. I think criticism is very healthy. All I'm saying is that that criticism has to be very specific. So it has to be, a, you cannot, I mean, if you talk for, I'm Moroccan, so if you talk about Moroccan women, it is a very, very different, they, they face very, very different challenges than say, I don't know, women in Afghanistan or women in Bosnia or women in Sudan, in the Sudan. So, so all I'm saying is that it's, it's much more useful and fruitful to talk in specifics. But I fear that when you say that, it's asking people to think in very complex terms about these issues. And that, oh, that makes people's heads hurt and they don't want to think <laughs> in, the, in, in these complex ways. It's much simpler to say Muslim women are. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, so, so um, yeah, so that's one of my pet peeves. Yeah, I mean, it feels, <laughs> pet peeve feels like a legitimately an understatement <laughs> in a way for, um, I guess I wonder if we go away from generalizing and, and just, so your situation, yeah. where as you talked about, you grew up in Morocco, you, in a number of places in your books, you refer to language and the dedication, I think, in Secret Son is saying that I'm, writing in English already falsifies what I'm gonna say to you. Yes. Uh, so this sense of a little bit, what's the language to use, what's the place? And I guess I wonder about the extent to which, first of all, uh, that feels like it pertains to you. Do you feel like English is something that, because it feels to me like I could learn English from you. Uh, <laughs> one, one of the ways it feels. So I guess I wonder how live is that? But the bigger question behind it is the question of so on the face of it, I look like I come from here. On the face of it, uh, you referred in an interview earlier today, you said people often see you as a vaguely brown girl. They do. And so that puts you in a position, not necessarily chosen, of sort of interpreting whatever the vaguely brown is. Yes. And what's, so I oh, I, I, yeah, that, that is another big, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really troubling when we look for people to interpret other cultures. It basically is based on this assumption that people are voiceless and people are not voiceless. People have voices, but we are not hearing those voices. And so because we are not hearing those voices, it's much easier to just listen to these sort of interpreters of Islam or interpreters of Muslim women or interpreters of a particular culture. And, and I'm always at great pains to say that I'm not an expert on Islam. There is no such thing as an expert on Islam, only because Islam is a religion, a geographical region, a, a multitude of cultures, a civilization, and no single person could possibly have that amount of expertise. Um, and that it's much better to speak about experts in very specific areas. So, you know, I don't know, an expert on Islamic architecture or an expert on political Islam or an expert on Islamic jurisprudence. Or those are things you can be an expert on. Islam, not so much. 
Um, and so, so I'm always at great pains to say that I'm not um, an expert, and I approach these things as a storyteller, and I use my own uh, personal experience and, and try to speak for myself um, about these issues, not for anybody else. Yeah. Um, the blog, the blog that you started years ago that was called Moorish Girl. It was. Still is. Yeah. And then I was thinking. redirected my website, but yeah. Redirected your <laughs> website? Because I, I don't really blog much anymore. Yeah. But the, even the title, The Moorish Girl, and then the title of the book, The Moor's Account. And I guess I wonder, just going Why? back to uh, going back to the main character of the big work you've just worked on, it's like, do you identify with this guy in a strong way, with Estebanico, with Mustafa? Is that something that just... Well, I identify with all of my characters when I write them. I mean, it, it was this... this for me, it was a way of, Moorish Girl was a way of reclaiming that term, and then that's kind of, I guess, is what ended up happening with, with this book as well. I mean, I don't know that I would say that, um, it's not so much that I identify with him, it's that I created him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, I, I, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but I really, in some sense, feel like I have been given this gift of um, th this story. I came across it completely by chance. And I, when I first saw it, I thought, this is crazy. Has anybody written a novel from his perspective? So I was searching on Amazon, trying to find, is there another yeah. novel, and, and there wasn't. And so I thought, I really felt, it felt like I had been given this gift. And so I tried to do my best to honor it. Um, but, uh, but I don't know that, um, I so much identify as mm -hmm. really having as much empathy for him as I could manage. Mm -hmm. And towards the end of that, when he's, he, it seems like maybe he's going to, uh, move towards freedom. I don't, this might be a spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> for those, but I guess I, I want to ask about this, uh, idea that towards the end, the folks with the weapons can't be combated with weapons, but only with stories. Um, I wanted to ask you, sort of, where does your love of story come from? Is there a, do you remember as a kid, is there a particular story that sort of locked in and helped you think? Not so much a story, but, um, but I remember when I was a little girl, um, my grandmother, who's deceased now, but, um, but when she was alive, she was a fantastic storyteller, and she was an illiterate uh, woman, but um, you know she would tell us these incredible stories. So, and at the same time, I was constantly reading. Uh, so I had exposure to both sort of like this oral storytelling, but also hearing and and reading um, rather uh, these books. And I think, and I grew up in a house full of books. My parents were both big readers. That's what we did all the time, every night was read, everybody was reading, everybody. And so, um, everybody in my house I mean. And so I think it wasn't that huge of a leap from reading and enjoying stories to having the urge to create your, you know, my own stories. So that's where, it, that's really where it came from. Yeah, it's, ma it's making, it, this is a little bit of a tangent that I should apologize for in advance, but I know some of the people here are in a program that Oregon Humanities runs called Humanity in Perspective. It's a it's a college level program. First, thanks for being here because it's the third night this week and it's usually two, so I just want to uh, say thanks for the work. But we're, we're about to be reading uh, something out of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, out of Second Samuel, okay. where King David does some bad things, uh, one after the other, and tries to cover them up. And then Nathan the prophet comes to him and tells him a story about a rich man, a poor man, and a youth. Uh, and how that how the rich man uh, treats the you for a traveler, and David reacts to the story with this strong sense of moral outrage, uh, which he can only see it in the story, but he can't see it in himself before then. So it's, I'm at it's in a way it's going back to what we started off talking about about the function of the story, both for the pleasure it provides, but for the moral discomfort that it usefully evokes. No, no, I, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, obviously, we go to stories primarily because it's enjoyable to hear stories. So there's this, this entertainment value. We like to hear stories. But stories really are how we make sense of the world around us. 
if you think about it from the moment that you learn to to speak and you know to understand your own language you're constantly surrounded by stories in many form in many forms so they can and they don't have to be written i mean a good piece of gossip is a story a joke is a story um uh, you know, the newspaper has stories, novels have stories, songs have stories. So yeah. stories, a portrait can, 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 ha can have an entire story in it. So we're s really surrounded by stories because stories are how we, we make sense of the world around us. That's why they're so intimately tied to our survival. That's why Shahrazad has to tell a story every night if she is to survive. Uh, so, so the two are, to me, very, very connected. But a story, aside from all of these functions, if you will, it can, it can console. I mentioned that earlier. It can challenge. It can make you scared. It can, it can inspire you. It can redeem you. It can poison you. It can do all kinds of things. It's really the most powerful um, weapon. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like yeah. the story as a weapon. That's, uh, yeah. I mean, story is art. Story is weapon is a strong way to put it. I want to, uh, I guess, prepare us to, uh, to turn towards questions. The last thing that I want to ask is I'm, I want to invite people uh, who have questions. There's a microphone over here. And so if, as you're ready to ask questions, to line up towards the back. Um, the last question maybe I want to ask is uh, about the last thing you said, and that is story as weapon. <laughs> Um, does one come Words to your that head? come back to haunt you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is there is there a particular story, whether a book or an experience or something you heard that feels like here is the kind of weapon that stories can best be? Story as a weapon. Do you see what I mean? With that words come back to haunt you. You say things, and then and then people are like, yeah, what did you mean this? What did you mean exactly? And then you have to think, wait, I actually have to think about this a bit more. <laughs> um, a story as a weapon. We could, I mean, we could soften it if it's helpful and just talk about no, a story. No, no, no. I mean, no, that's very, that's a very valid point. I have to illustrate it. I'll, I'll, I mean, I can come up with, with the very basic example. Um, it can be a weapon of, it can be, it can, how shall I put this? Um, I mean, I, I'm thinking, because it came up today, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, the stories he tells there, he uses to sort of galvanize his supporters and to get them to take action. Could that be a form of weapon? Um, I, I mean, and they can be used to inspire. So you can think of letter from Berlin Gun Jail. I mean, it's just, it's just endless once you start thinking about the function of story. There is, story is life. Story is, is really how we live. We, we can't exist without them. That's what separates us from <laughs> All right, it's so true. can we say it's a true. quick We're the thank only you to Leila? <laughs> <Eva. laughs> so again, there's a microphone here, and I would encourage, uh, as you have questions, if you could uh, think about the likelihood that other people will have questions after you, and that uh, if you could just introduce yourself briefly, that would be great. We may also, it sounds like there's a possibility that we will try to take a question or two from Twitter if they come in. <laughs> um, now that I <laughs> talked about Twitter, that, oh, you bet. It, it may happen. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody is going to be brave and step up. Uh, yeah, I hear some bravery coming. Great. I recognize you. <laughs> yes, we met earlier. <laughs> My name's Tiara. I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer. I served in Morocco from 2012 to 2014. And I'd like to know, how do you empower Moroccan women to tell their stories? Because I sort of felt like coming from the US and living there for two years, I, I noticed things about the absence of female voices in mainstream media and like you said, in the cafes, I can completely relate yes, to yes, that. Yes, that's it was very really glaring. It's difficult cafes. to find a place to get a coffee where I didn't feel awkward just sitting there. Um, so I would like to know how you give back to Moroccan women. That's interesting. How do I empower Moroccan women, which feels like such a big, right? That's such a big responsibility. 
Uh, but I, but I, mean, I can tell you, so, so um, um, when I was on my Fulbright uh, fellowship to Morocco, I conducted a writing workshop as volunteer uh, for uh, university students um, to write their stories. And it was interesting. It, I, I felt like I learned a lot from it. I learned a lot. I always say that he who comes to, to borrow from Kurtzia, that he who comes to teach learns the keenest of lessons. But in any case, um, it's, it's, those kinds of workshops are very useful. I know that the late uh, Fatima Bernisi, I don't know if you're fam familiar with her work, she, she, that's what she did, the caravan of stories is what she called it, that's what she did, she did a lot of that. Um, I mean, I, I, whenever I'm there, I give talks, I speak, and um, it's interesting for me to hear back from younger Moroccan uh, women writers, and I do hear from them regularly asking for advice or opinion about these things, and I try to help when I can. Um, but obviously I don't live there, and I'm not as engaged on a daily basis in, in, these, um, in these fights. I don't know if I've answered your question, have I? To a certain extent anyway, <laughs> barring. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, the th I, I feel like the very act of, um, of writing these stories is in, in some sense, it can be empowering to others. Um, because again, visibility is so contested. And um, like, just to give you an example, I spoke to my mother uh, on the phone this weekend, and she was telling me, oh, you know, my cousin's daughter, who's 10, she says, I want to grow up and be just like Layla. You know, so it's, it's very amusing and very cute, but it's the idea that she, she wants to claim that visibility and the reason she's saying this is because she saw me on TV once. And I'm sure that that's what's connected. It's not because she's read any of these books that, you know, <laughs> she <laughs> she's too young anyway to read, but it's, I think that that's this idea of wanting that visibility. Um, and does, uh, can I just ask a quick follow-up? I don't know, it related to what you were saying earlier, but empowerment as a goal, does that seem like empowerment of others is something we should be after? That may be too obvious a question. I mean, it's, my goal as a writer is to tell stories, and my goal as an essayist is to think through these issues, and I certainly can't do, I can't, um, do all these things and then also be an activist. It just seems like there's only so many hours in the day to, to, to do all of these things. So of course, when I'm given the opportunity, I, I take it. Um, but it's not, it's like I don't consider myself an activist. It's not a role that I spend hours of my time doing, even though I volunteer a lot. I do a lot of um, volunteer work, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not a primary role for me. There is an empty microphone over there, if anybody would like to ask questions. I don't know if anything has come in. Oh, there's one. Hi. Uh, my name is Tally Smith. Um, I live in Portland, and I read books, and I <laughs> very much look forward to reading yours. I've read a lot about it. Um, I think what's coming up for me is um, what I think you, I wonder if writing this book and the book and the essays and all the things you do give you a sense of comfort that you're doing your part to tell these stories, to help inspire a movement, change, whatever. Um, and I think the question of, um, people not wanting to look into that darkness, to look at the abyss, because I certainly understand that. Um, you know, it's, it's a complex question, and I think, um, I think part of what I'm standing up here for is just to share a little bit of what it's like to, you know, try to live your life and make that change happen. And the very, very difficult, um, kind of strain that that causes when you, you know, I'm not a writer, I'm a designer. I'm not doing anything in particular that's going to, you know, change the world in the ways that you are, but um, 
I just, I wonder if that ever does get uncomfortable for you. Do you ever feel that you can't quite do enough and, and how you handle that? Um, well, so that's, that's an interesting um, comment. I, I don't think that, I, I would be very naive if I believed that any kind of novel or piece can really change uh, the world. But as a writer, what else can I do? As a writer, the only thing I have are words. The only thing I have are stories. And it seems to me that that in itself is, um, it's a full, uh, fulfilling enough um, process on its own without trying to change the world. If it does, that would be great. But if, but it's, it seems to me that it takes a lot more than that to change the world. And that's why I say I'm not an activist. The real activists are the people who are now going out there and making that change. I'm the person who's kind of sitting um, on the side and kind of observing everything and sort of narrating it um, around the campfire at night. I'm not the one going out there doing battle. I'm the person that, you know, <laughs> around the campfire at night is telling stories. So, so I think that th those are two things. And then does it ever get tiring? I, and I, if I have to be completely candid with you, that the most days writing and this writing life and the fact that I get to do this work that is very meaningful to me as a person feels like a gift, but I would be lying that if I said that it doesn't also feel like a curse. Only because I do it because I have no other choice. This is, to me, this is, this is what I've always done. This is what I've always wanted to do. I have no interest in anything else. And, um, but it's just difficult. I mean, it's not, it's not the easiest um, way to go through life. Uh, I wish there are, there are plenty of days when I wish I could lobotomize the part of my brain that cares so much about what is going on around me, but I can't. I mean, that is just kind of how my brain is wired. And so I just have to accept that that's, that's part of, of um, who I am, that I, I, just, I, I have this urge to tell stories and to, to write about the world around me. I'm not up here to say anything embarrassing. I'm actually so. Yes, good, good, Dave. Uh, <laughs> That's a good thing. Say, good that, call. say that. Beat me out front later if you need any embarrassing <laughs> facts about Layla. Um, no, so you are one of the best read people that I know, and you are one of the smartest people that I know. Oh, how I flattering. Say that. That's true. Um, <laughs> recently, I remember you recommended a book by Philip Roth on a list that yes. totally shocked me. I didn't expect to see it there. I went out and bought it and haven't read it yet, but it's actually at home. Um, so I was wondering, these are a bunch of people who are okay with difficult thoughts. Um, they are okay with what? They are okay with difficult thoughts. They are okay with being taken into situations that are not necessarily comfortable. Off the top of your head, in any form, fiction or nonfiction, three recommendations for these people to go out and read. I like it. Let's do this quickly before I have much chance to think. So, so the plot against America, Philip Roth. I know I, someday when I have time, I will write about how Philip Roth is, is a novelist of the Muslim experience. I'm not kidding. I, I will write that someday. But the plot against America basically presents an alternate history in which Lindbergh becomes president and what happens uh, to a Jewish family uh, in America. And it's an ex excellent book. And it has never been more relevant than in this electoral uh, year. So go out and read it. Um, earlier, you were asking me what I had read that was good. Uh, I've been raving to people about a book that is actually a few years old, but I only got to it uh, last year. It's Ben Fountain's um, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, um, which I highly recommend. It's a book about um, a, a company of, I think I believe they're army uh, soldiers who are brought to the Dallas Cowboys halftime show during the Super Bowl and they're kind of used as props. And it really asks us to imagine um, what, what it must be like for soldiers to be paraded as props by uh, politicians and corporations. Um, and let's see what else. Hmm, a third book. This is, I have to tell you something. I keep a log book of all of the books that I read. And this is for that reason, and I really wish I carried it with me because then it was like, oh yeah, I like this one. Um, what 
what else have I read? I've read so many things that are great. Uh, Eulabis on Immunity. Uh, I think you should read that. It's a great uh, book that asks us to uh, think through these uh, vaccines and, and the, how, we, how vaccines are talked about uh, in, in American society and the discourse around that and what it really means to sort of expose yourself to others, what it means with the, the fact that we now have cleanses, what does it, you know, why are we so obsessed with this idea of purity and, clean, and, and cleanliness in, in society? Is that three books, is that good? Okay. And the, funny, the funny thing about that third recommendation is Eulabis was in the hot seat you're in right now. Oh, was she really? Just a few months ago. Oh, so good. talking about on immunity. So good. I think there's strong agreement here. Good. Well, yeah. good. Um, hi, hi, I'm Aaron. I'm a student at uh, Reed College. Um, so I found that Baldwin quote that you brought up uh, pretty interesting. And as you said, that there's, I, th I think that's true. There's no necessarily any place that's going to be you know, perfect. Um, so I'm curious if, if we like accept that premise, uh, what for you, like the function, either literarily or uh, literally in life, uh, of home is, uh, if not to be you know, necessarily the, the all safe place? Well, I, I mean, in some sense, you can see why I quoted that. Because if there are no untroubled countries in the world, then the whole question of where is a comfortable place to be, it, it stops being about a place, and it starts being about the people around you. Um, so that, that's in terms of person. But in terms of, th that's in terms of the personal dimension. But in terms of um, sort of the essayist dimension, to me, it's always a good reminder because we live in a time where people, there's uh, this, this great um, surge of wanting things to be simple, wanting things to say, well, um, these people over there have all these troubles and all these wars and all of that and, and things are so much better here. And on the surface of it, Sure, I mean, I can see certain measures, right, of living, things like literacy, health, all of these are measures that we all agree on tell us something about a society. Um, but more than that, when you look at things like, I grew up in a country where I never had to worry about going into a school and somebody shooting me for no reason. <laughs> uh, and so, and now I teach on a college campus where I think about it all the time. I think, you know, we have things like drills and, and worrying about active shooter situations. So this is what, it, it really, it forces you to not be so complacent and to think that things, it's, it, who cares who's better or who's worse? We have to worry about improving life here and now, wherever we happen to be. Hi, Hello. I'm Gail, <laughs> and I get to teach literature, which I also feel very blessed to do every day. Um, and I think that the question that I'd like to ask you to talk about a little bit is a question of language. I was struck, Adam, when you talked about a linguistic poem, and I was thinking about the way that, <clears throat> although we probably all speak one language when we are first learning how to speak. Some of us actually grow up speaking two languages. Some of us, I grew up with one language which I completely lost and then two more languages, one of which I'm speaking now. Um, <laughs> and I'm struck by your use in hope and other dangerous pursuits um, with the interjection of what I take to be Moroccan Arabic. Um, I usually when I come across words that I don't know, I've learned that I can Google and usually I will get a translation. But no, this does not work. Um, so, and I noticed that that technique is not one that you used for Mustafa in the Moore's account, which makes perfect sense because he's speaking, it's his account, it's his narration, his relation as it were. Um, but those, those, those intrusions of, of words that we don't understand, even names of clothing that we can't distinguish one kind from another, um, defamiliarize what we're beginning to empathize with, the character 
of a particular speaker right. or narrator. So how, how do you see that interaction between the creation of empathy with a character and the distancing for even a moment of the reader through the intrusion of other languages functioning? Um, I actually do use it in the Moore's account as well. Maybe it's not as noticeable, but I do use it. Um, so you can see things like, you know, in a passage about Fez that describes some of the um, some of the landmarks, and it uses Arabic words for that. So um, I think it it it's if I have to get all academic about it. <laughs> It's a way to basically posit a narrative in which the, um, the Western gaze is not central. In other words, it's a story that is told by this slave about his people. And yes, it's rendered imperfectly in English by me, but it is still his story. And so periodically uh, using those words reminds you that you're, that, that of your gaze, if you will. Um, and it, so it's something that um, I was using in Hope as well, maybe in Secret Sun as well. I don't know if I've answered your question. But you know that Juno Diaz has this joke about it, and I'm not going to use his salty language, don't worry. <laughs> but he says, you know, you can, you can, they can read a book that's some one third elvish and nobody complains, and you put one Spanish word and they're all complaining. <laughs> but he uses, yeah, you look it up. <laughs> Hi, my name is Greg. I'm a Presbyterian pastor. I was listening the other day to Krista Tippett's On Being radio show. She was interviewing Sister Simone Campbell, uh, who's one of the nuns on the bus, uh, a, an activist Catholic woman. And um, it was Sister Simone's strong sense that ISIS and other uh, things uh, in the Islamic world, um, speaking, this was sparked by your comment about story as a weapon, um, that that's evoked by the sense of the assault of American, particularly, or Western stories on um, Islamic or Muslim or Arabic culture. I wonder if that sparks anything in you. Um. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Krista Tippett. I was on a panel with her at USC on freedom of speech, a, a lovely woman. Um, the, I, I, don't think, I don't think it has so much to do with the encroachment of American stories. The Middle East um, is quite well acquainted with American stories. It, it sees those stories through America's movies, its songs, its uh, television series. I grew up singing the Beatles and, and you know, all of, I mean, you know, The Cure, all of those <laughs> bands. I'm aging myself, I'm sure. Um, uh, Duran Duran. <laughs> so we're gonna go 80s. <laughs> um, long before I spoke a single word of English. Um, so the, the net effect of that is that the average reader or viewer in North Africa and the Middle East has been exposed to everyday, ordinary Americans. I grew up watching The Cosby Show, which I realize now has taken on very, <laughs> very different um, connotations, but it was my window into America. I mean, and, and, and what, what, what Americans were doing every night. So it is a kind of familiarity that if you flip it, how many Americans have been have that kind of familiarity with even one out of the 22 countries of the Arab League, never mind all of the, the North Africa and the Middle East. The result of that is that people from North Africa and the Middle East have developed, because they've been exposed to these stories, and here we go back to the question of empathy, this, I, they, they, they know that you're a person and that you are not your government, and so, the, the, the problem that they have is with US government and its policies in the Middle East, not so much with everyday Americans, but that kind of nuance, I fear, is not necessarily present here, where the only time that you are hearing these stories about the Middle East 
is when you see the front page of the New York Times with some dude in a beard and, you know, half covered and, you know, I don't know what. And so, so it, it is an imbalance. And I don't think that they're so much preoccupied with the stories that America is telling the world. I think they are preoccupied with, at least in the case of ISIS, with gaining territory, with propagating their idea, with our ideas. They are preoccupied with resurrecting a world that never was. Um, and, you know, that the, 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 their view of Islamic history is very flawed. And so they, 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 they want to resurrect something that, I don't think that they want to resurrect, I don't know what, uh, the golden age in Baghdad. I don't think they would want poets writing you know, uh, about wine. That's not what they want, even though that's the golden age, but they don't want that. So that's what I mean, is that they want to resurrect a world um, that really never was. And, and they have very uh, political goals and um, uh, social goals and, and religious goals, and, and those things are quite separate from whatever it stories America is telling the world. Hi, my name is Fletcher, and uh, I'm part of the Humanities and Perspective class. Hi, hi. Fletcher, <laughs> what's going on? That's my philosophy teacher right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully, this is just an easy one. Um, <laughs> three tips on how to write from someone who might not have a writing background. Wow, <laughs> you got <laughs> I knew the minute you said this is an easy question, I'm like, oh God, here comes the tough one. <laughs> um, three tips for someone who does not have a writing background. Tip number one, tip number two, tip number three. So, you know, it's all three in one. I'm going to make this really easy. <laughs> Read. I feel that um, reading is... You can, you can be a reader and not be a writer, but you can never be a writer without being a reader. And so I think that it is extremely important if you want to write any kind of stories that you read constantly. You have to read, 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 read. I always tell my students that inside of you there is a sort of reservoir of words, and by reading you're replenish replenishing it and making it possible for you to draw from it when the time comes for you to write your own stories. Um, so for example, Cormac McCarthy says books are made out of other books. And that's what it means. You're not going to be able to write a story if you're not constantly reading other stories. So three tips in one. <laughs> Thank you. And then maybe last two questions, if we could. Yeah. yeah. Hi, um, my name is Leah Squires. I'm also a return Peace Corps volunteer from Morocco. Oh. Um, we came together, so it's that's not. Great. <laughs> that's great. That's um, great. So one of the aspects of Moroccan culture that I really fell in love with was hikayat, um, or the oral storytelling tradition. And you mentioned your grandmother was someone who passed on mm -hmm. stories to you. And mm -hmm. it's a really rich tradition mm -hmm. in Morocco. Mm -hmm. But here in the States, we don't have the same affinity with an oral storytelling tradition. And so I was hoping you could comment on um, if there is even a difference in the merit and value that you see in an oral storytelling tradition versus the, the novels and the written word and, and what we consume here in the States. I mean, this is such a complex question. I was reading, I think it was last year, about one of the last storytellers in the Jmarifna in Marrakesh who had passed away. And it was just such a sad story. Mm -hmm. Uh, that this guy who had like dozens of stories in his repertoire had died. And I wondered if any of those had been uh, written down and preserved. Uh, there is a tradition of oral storytelling in, in this country as well. And it survives in the form of songs, for example, in the South and places like that. But uh, the question is uh, how many of those you know, end up being recorded, and the answer very is, is very few. So it just makes it harder to preserve that that heritage. Um, so yes, I mean, there I, I do have a sense of um, loss when I think about my grandmother and about the stories that she had, and also about the kinds of knowledge that she had. Um, for example, about herbs and things like that. That all that is lost with her because it was never written down. Um, and then in terms of the value. I, the first thing that came to my mind when you started talking about it is this uh, scholar named Leila Ahmed, 
who teaches in, at the Harvard Divinity School and is the author of a great book called Women and Gender in Islam and many other books, but uh, that's sort of a seminal book. Um, and in it, she brings up the idea that um, in Islamic tradition, we have the, the sort of the written heritage, right? So that would be the Quran, the Hadith, the commentary, the jurisprudence, all of that. And that field historically has been dominated by males. And then she brings up the idea of the oral tradition of Islam that, that uh, we get exposed to. And those are very different traditions. And she finds that the oral one is a, is a tradition that is much more, um, um, I guess for lack of a better word, empathetic and open to the world than the, than the Islam of texts. Because when people kind of become obsessed with the text, then they worry more about the letter than about the spirit of what, what it is that they're reading. So I don't know if that uh, has answered your question, but there is obviously a huge, huge, huge value to that oral storytelling that, you know, by definition, if it is oral, it's not uh, recorded and it's lost. So. Hi, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Noah. I'm a student at Reed College. Um, I have a question, I'm not exactly sure how to phrase it. I'm simultaneously very curious and also very afraid of looking like an idiot in front of everyone, including you. But um, one, uh, in our English class, we were reading Hope and Other Dangerous Pursuits, and one of the characters that really like, intrigued me, and I think everyone else in our class, was Faten. Um, and we see her really like in two stories, three, I guess, if you count like the first one, but it's like a brief reference. But in like the first um, story, it's like it's not focalized through, it's through Larby, and then we see like her with Larby's daughter, and then how like Faten has these, she's reading the, the, the uh, like Islamic Brotherhood text and how that like rubs off on, on Larby's daughter and like she has these very like extreme um, sort of views. And then we see her like in the second half when she's in Spain and like um, where she, she's working as a, as a prostitute selling her body. And then, I mean, that's the reason she gets into Spain is that she, she goes to the garden. And, right. and we have like, um, you know, before, but when she like remembers her experience doing that, she talks about the word from her imam saying, um, you know, extreme times call for extreme measures. And then she's like laying down in her bed at like some part of the story. She's remembering her times with Larby's daughter saying that, you know, she had the luxury of faith, sort of. And that was like one big question I had was, because we like, we see like in a story with Martine, like one of, like, you know, the one of her customers who she takes like a liking to, but he says, you know, I've been reading the Quran and like, I really like, um, they know how to treat a woman right or whatever, but then she's like, um, you know, that's, that's, she gets really offended and she says, you know, don't tell me things about my culture that you don't know. And that's kind of like an expression right. of so, so, so what is your question then? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, yeah, a better question. Then. But I think I'm sure it's very enjoyable for people to hear no, 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 about no, the story. No, my bad, no. Um, I think it was regar like regarding the, the gray zone and sort of like, you know, how on one side there's like the, you said like the crusaders on the other side, like, right. um, like how do you think faith like plays a role in that? And how do you like people in like the gray zone can like express their faith without joining these two like extreme sides? Like what role do you think faith plays? Right, I mean, it, it, it <laughs> <laughs> you did it. <laughs> so, so um, I think it comes, it, it comes down to the role of faith in life, but also in the role of faith in public life. So, um, most people have some sort of belief or unbelief, the things that they believe, but the question is, where do they see those beliefs playing out in, in public and particularly in, in politics? And um, it seems to me that it's very difficult to preserve a gray zone of coexistence if uh, faith is allowed to play a role in politics. Whereas if faith is a private matter that people, you know, use privately and enjoy privately and find comfort and succor in com privately, then it allows for that space for everybody to coexist together. When faith then becomes a, a political thing and gets used by either side to drive uh, political discourse, then that's when, um, then that's how that gray zone uh, shrinks. I don't know if I've answered your question. Is that, is that good? Okay, good. We're gonna good. we're gonna right, take we one go. question from Kyle via Twitter or via yep. Kyle from Twitter. Twitter. So one from Twitter. I hope it's not about a hamburger or whatever. 
No, it's <laughs> nothing about a hamburger, <laughs> at least that I can see or okay. infer from it. Uh, from TRD, what advice do you constantly give your creative writing students about creating engaging characters? Creating engaging characters. Well, I mean, I think characters cannot be extensions of yourself. Characters have their own lives, and oftentimes when you are writing them, the best way to let them have their own life is to let them speak, let them have dialogue, and just let them kind of um, talk to one another. And oftentimes that helps to distance yourself from char your characters so you don't think of them as, uh, you know, extensions of yourself, but as having lives of their own. Um, to not try to make them perfect, that, you know, nobody wants to read about, about perfect characters, right? That's why we hear, you know, they lived happily ever after, dot, dot, dot. It's because happiness is the lack of story and conflict is story. So by the same token, you know, characters have to have some sort of trouble and complexity for us to be interested in them and to be engaged in them. Um, I hope that answers your question, yeah. And nice to use the word hope there at the end again, too, which <laughs> ties back to the first book. I want to do touche. Yeah, <laughs> uh, two things. First, I just want to say a huge thanks, uh, Layla, for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so tomorrow morning, Layla is heading to Bend. Bend. Uh, if anyone wants to make the trip, she'll be talking at the Volcanic Theater and Pub tomorrow evening. Uh, I'm looking forward to being there in the audience. Um, I want to uh, remind people that this is the first in a series. Uh, again, Pulitzer Prize winners and finalists. So Hector Tobar in April, Isabel Wilkerson uh, in July, and Catherine Boo in the fall. But I can't remember which month. We also have lots of conversation projects happening. Uh, and so if you're interested in finding groups of people to really engage and talk through stuff where everyone's getting in, please check in with anyone from Oregon Humanities that's back there or just check us out uh, online. Um, I think I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. And uh, Layla will be signing books in back. So please uh, don't be shy about stopping there and maybe join me one more time in saying a oh, big thanks. Oh, thank you, Adam. Thank you. <laughs>